I just had to tell someone. Have you ever had something that you just couldn't hold in? Maybe it was a positive experience. You got a new job or a new relationship or maybe you got a new toy. I was at my nephew's a few weeks back and one of the first things they wanted to show me was their new Pokemon cards. Maybe it was a negative experience though. Instead of getting a job, you just lost a job. Instead of a new relationship, you had a bad breakup. And you just have to talk with someone to process it. Or maybe you just had the worst food you've ever eaten. You took a bite, you spit it out, you said, that's disgusting. And so you turn to your friend, you say, here, you've got to try some of this. We love to share our experiences with one another. Sometimes we just can't hold it in. We just have to tell someone. Like Audio Adrenaline once saying, I've got a secret and I cannot keep it. So too, as we're in this sermon series on Easter witnesses, we have different people who experience the Easter story. We started with blind Bartimaeus, then we went to the Roman guards, then Mary Magdalene, and then Doubting Thomas, and now we turn to the apostles. The apostles witnessed something incredible, something miraculous, and the apostles just had to tell somebody. In fact, Jesus commissions them to do just that, to tell somebody in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says to his apostles, he says, you will be my witnesses. And then he says how they're going to do it. First in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and even to the end of the earth. Now, he said this to the 11 apostles. But if you're losing count like me, when my Sunday school teacher taught me the song, it went like this, that there were 12 disciples that Jesus called to help him. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Judas, Simon, Thaddeus, and Bartholomew. We're one over. Who are we missing? Who got cut? Well, you remember it was Judas. In Matthew chapter 27, Judas betrays Jesus and then he hangs himself. And so the number 12 goes down to the number 11. But Peter wants that number 11 to go back to number 12. He says, we need an apostle. We need somebody to replace Judas so we can continue our work of being witnesses to the gospel message. So Peter quotes Psalms when he says this. He says, let another take his office. That is, let another replace the office of Judas. Do you remember who it was that replaced Judas? It was Matthias. But as they're trying to choose someone to replace Judas, what was the requirement? What had to have happened? In order to replace Judas, the apostles had to be an eyewitness. They had to have a first-hand account of the Easter story. Now, if you were there in the crowd as Peter's trying to choose someone to replace Judas, and you throw up your hand, you said, I'm in. I want to throw my hat in the ring I want to apply to be an apostle. And you say, after all, I know all about the Easter story. In fact, this morning as I was drinking my coffee, I was reading the Washington Daily News, I was flipping to the sports section, and I saw right there a big old picture of the resurrection of Jesus, and I, I read the whole write-up. And then as I was driving to work that same day, I'm driving, I'm listening to My Bridge FM, 97.5 was fuzzy, so I turned to 104.5. I'm so thankful they've got two channels now. And they had an hour-long special interviewing people who had been there. And if that wasn't enough, when I was at work later the day, you know, I got a little bit bored. I was scrolling on Facebook, and I was on one of those groups, the What's Happening Washington, North Carolina group, and they had a whole video of people talking about what happened at the Easter story. I know all about it. I'd make a great apostle. Put me in. Well, you'd make a great disciple, but Peter wouldn't choose you as an apostle. Because to be an apostle, you had to be an eyewitness, Acts chapter 1, verse 21 through 22, as Peter's making his selection, he says, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Peter would write later in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. He said, We didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The apostles had firsthand accounts. They had trustworthy experiences. They were eyewitnesses. 
Now, the apostles weren't just eyewitnesses. They were also witnesses. You see, eyewitnesses can see things but not say things. Imagine you're at a corner store and, and you get robbed. You get mugged. And then those people flee. And, but you've got a crowd over here and they say, hey, listen, we saw everything that happened to you. And you say, that's great. And so you call the police. The police come and they start taking testimonies from everyone. And all of them start pleading the fifth. They say, oh, we don't want to get wrapped up in any of that. We don't, you know, we don't want none of that. Well, they're eyewitnesses, but they're not being witnesses for you. They're not helping you very much. So this is what the apostles were. They weren't just eyewitnesses, but they were also witnesses, and they spread the gospel message. Robert B. Gaffin Jr. says that the single most important function of the apostles is their witness bearing, and that the focus of the apostolic witness, especially in Acts, is Christ's resurrection. And so as you go throughout the book of Acts, filled in its pages is these apostles bearing witness to the Easter story. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus commissions them and says, you will be my witnesses. At the end of Acts 1, they choose Matthias to get that number to 12. And then you turn to Acts chapter 2 and already they're bearing witness. Peter, you remember, in Acts 2 is preaching at Pentecost. He's preaching to the sum of the people that put him up on the cross, put Jesus up on the cross. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 32, it says, But Peter, standing with the eleven apostles, lifted up his voice and he addressed them. And he said, This Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses. You turn the page to Acts chapter 3. And Peter and John, they just finished healing a lame beggar. And in Acts 3.15, it says, Peter said to the crowds, You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Turn the page to Acts chapter 4, and the Jewish council just warned Peter and John to stop speaking about Jesus. So in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, Peter and John reply, they say, we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. They just had to tell someone. In Acts chapter 5, now it's the high priest that tells the apostles, we strictly charged you not to teach in Jesus' name. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and the apostles respond. They say, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. And God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. You flip to Acts all the way to Acts chapter 10. And this is becoming the end of Peter and the apostles before Acts shifts to Paul and his missionary journey and Paul spreading the gospel. And about near the end as Peter and the apostles wrap up in Acts chapter 10 verse 39 through 43, Peter says to the Gentiles, and we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God, he raised him on the third day. And he made him to appear not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach the gospel to people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The apostles couldn't help but bear witness to the Easter story. And aren't you glad that they did? Because their witness changed the world. Edwin Blum comments that in the church age, which is the age that we're in, all Christians have come to know Christ directly or indirectly through the apostles' witness. Jesus knew his missions would succeed. He would die and be raised. He would send forth the Spirit. The apostles would preach. People would be converted and the church would be formed. And now, 2,000 years later, here we are at First Church, founded upon the apostles' witness. And it's because of the apostles' witness that we can sing in the traditional services we sing this Sunday, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And as we'll sing in, in the contemporary service that my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. 
And it's their witness that then becomes our witness. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, he says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received myself, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. What Paul received, he passed on to us. And what we receive, we must pass on to others. Let us not keep the gospel message to ourselves. What would it be like for us to receive the gospel message and not to pass it along to somebody else? Well, it would be like you being taught how to read as a kid and then not teaching your kids to read. It would be like you uh, being taught how to ride a bike as a kid and not teaching your kids now how to ride a bike. It would be like you found a free money machine and instead of printing money to help out you, your neighbors, and everyone around you, you just hid it in your basement. It would be like there's this deadly virus going around. You've got unlimited antidotes for everyone that can save their lives. And instead of distributing it, you just keep it to yourself because you're afraid of what they might say. Receiving the gospel and not sharing it is like climbing a ladder and then kicking it down for the people behind you. It's like you're being rescued from a cave and you're being pulled up on that helicopter. They say, is there anyone else down in that cave? You say, nope, it's just me. And you leave everyone else in the dark. What we receive, we must pass along to others. The Sunday school song said there were 12 disciples that Jesus called to help him. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Judas, Simon, Thaddeus, and Bartholomew. But by my last account, they're all dead and gone. They're no longer bearing witness to the gospel except through their writings. They're dead and gone, but the song doesn't end that way. You remember how the song continues? It says, he has called us to. He has called us to. We are his disciples. I am one and you. He has called us to. He has called us to. We are his disciples and we his work must do. So let me ask you today, are you continuing the work of the apostles? Are you bearing witness to the Easter story? You know, we've got empty seats every Sunday that we come to church. And I wonder if one of them could be filled next Sunday by someone you invite this week to church. Someone you witness to. Now, I hear your objections already. You say, Timmy, I'm not an apostle. I'm not Peter. I'm not James. And I'm not John. And you say, Timmy, you don't know a lot about me, but I've got quite a bit of flaws. I've got mistakes in my past that you don't know about. And you don't want me being a spokesperson for Christ. God wouldn't want to use me as his witness. Well, we know the apostles were eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses who became then witnesses. And they were witnesses who were model witnesses for us. But the apostles were also flawed witnesses. One thing we know about the apostles is that each one of the apostles deserted Jesus. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Jesus is at the Last Supper with all his apostles. And he's talking to them, and it says, Jesus said to the apostles, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And so that very night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas comes with his crowd, with his mob, and they've got their clubs and their swords. And the disciples deserted Jesus. The sheep scattered from the shepherd. Matthew chapter 26, verse 56 says, Then all the disciples left him and fled. Worst of all was Peter. Now, Peter confessed Christ, and he said that famous confession that we now have people repeat at baptisms and when they place their membership. In Matthew 16, 16, Peter replies, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Peter promised to Jesus his faithfulness. In Matthew 26, verse 33, Peter says, Jesus, though they all will fall away from you, I will never fall away from you. And Jesus says, no, truly, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter doubles down. He says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then that night, Peter denies Jesus. 
First, a servant girl comes up to Peter. And she says, you were with Jesus, the Galilean. Peter says, I I don't know what you mean. Second, another servant girl comes up to Peter and says, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter says, I do not know the man. Third, some bystanders say, certainly you're one of them because your accent betrays you. You you speak just like them. We can tell that you were with him. And what is it Peter says? It says, then Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Soon after this, Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. And in Matthew 28, Jesus appears to his 11 apostles to give them the great commission, to send them out as witnesses and disciple makers. And I can imagine what it was like at that scene. You've got the 11 disciples there, and I imagine Peter perhaps was hiding near the back. And what does Jesus do? He says, you, Peter, come here. He said, I I remember you saying that you wouldn't deny me. And and what did you do? You denied me three times. And he says, and you might deny that you denied me, but I've got receipts. Now, what would a cancel culture Christ do in this moment? He said, Peter, I saw what you've been posting. I got right here. What does this say, Peter? It says right here, plain and simple, it says your name, Peter, at the rock. It's got your picture. You can't deny it. What is it you said? You said, I never knew that man. And in fact, it's been verified by independent fact checkers, and it's got the date and everything on it, Peter. You said, I never knew that man. I said, Peter, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Get out of here. Is that what Jesus said? That's not how I remember the story. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, it says the 11 disciples went to Galilee and Jesus came to them. And what did he say instead? He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, it says, When they had come together, that is the apostles, Jesus said to them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and even to the end of the earth. And Peter took that message, and he spent the rest of his life bearing witness to the resurrection of Christ. Aren't you glad that we don't have a cancel culture Christ? Aren't you glad that we have a God of second chances? We have a God of second chances who can use imperfect people to proclaim a perfect God. And each of us is like Peter. We've all made mistakes. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians, he he gives us an image of what we're like. Paul in 2 Corinthians, he calls us jars of clay. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever done planting, you probably have a jar that looks a little bit like this. It's all dirty and stained. You've got cracks and you've got chips, but you've got this jar, right? Now, for many of you, you can relate. Paul's calling us this jar and you say, Timmy, I get it. Just like this has cracks and chips, I've got scars from my past. You've got blemishes on your record. You've got things you've thought, things you've said, things you've done that you're ashamed and you feel broken. And you think, how could God ever use someone like me? Uh, Far too often we focus on the jar. We focus on other people we see and their past and their mistakes. But what is it that Paul says we should focus on? Paul says what's important isn't the jar, it's what's inside the jar. What is it he says? He says in 2 Corinthians verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, and verse 7, he says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. But we have this, this treasure. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We're all just broken and chipped jars of clay, but inside us we have the gospel message. And that's what's valuable, and any one of us can carry that treasure. 
John Chrysostom says that the power of God is most conspicuous when it performs mighty works by using vile and lowly things. You see, if God can use Peter, then God can use you. Despite your cracks, your chips, your flaws, you can carry the gospel message. You can proclaim the Easter story. Because God uses imperfect people to proclaim a perfect God. We have this treasure in jars of clay. So will you keep this treasure to yourself or will you share it with someone this week? Because sometimes you just can't hold it in. You just have to tell somebody. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we are so thankful for all the wonderful things you've did through the Easter story. God, I pray that our, as our lives are changed, we can take that gospel message and we can share it with anyone we encounter. God, that we can boldly proclaim it and witness to it as the apostles did. God, we love you, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.